nervous system. Okay, and we said that it had two different divisions, the autonomic division and the somatic division. So let's group the sympathetic and parasympathetic as the autonomic division. And then we'll look at the somatic division separately. But both are part of the peripheral nervous system. Okay, everything outside of brain and spinal cord. So let's look at a cross section of the spinal cord relevant to each of these areas. So here is sympathetic. Here is parasympathetic. And then here is somatic. Now, because in the sympathetic nervous system, we have a short preganglionic neuron, we're gonna draw that in first. And then there's a point of synapse here, the ganglia. And then we have a long postganglionic neuron. All right, these are gonna end differently. So we'll draw that in as well. They're not gonna end in axon terminals. They're gonna end at the neuroaffected junction where we have these swellings called varicosities. So we'll illustrate that here as well. And then we'll also put in the parasympathetic division, which has the opposite, a longer preganglionic neuron and a shorter postganglionic neuron, okay? With the same axon ending here, okay? We can describe both of these regions where the Postganglionic neuron, let's label these out first. So preganglionic here's our postganglionic. Right? Effectively, here's our ganglia. Same thing down here. And here's our more distal ganglia. Um, let's look at the somatic nervous system briefly. So we have one singular neuron, right? Nice and straightforward. This is called a motor neuron. Let's look at the difference in where these three neurons synapse first. So we know that it's going to be for the autonomic nervous system, It'll be things like our smooth muscle for one, right? Glands, adipose tissue, also cardiac muscle. Okay. Um, and that applies for both of these. And then down here in the somatic, it's skeletal muscle. Alrighty, let's look uh, at the spinal cord. So let's kind of shift gears and come back to the proximal bit here at the spinal cord. What is the area of the spinal cord where the fibers that travel in each of these neurons arise? So let's draw our sort of cut section view of the spinal cord here. All right, we've got our dorsal horn, our ventral horn. in each of these. Okay, so the fibers that arise in the autonomic division of the nervous system, we know these arise from the intermediate cell column, right? The lateral horn, so to speak. All right, so the fibers here arise from the lateral horn 
and then they travel out to join the spinal nerve. The fibers in the somatic nervous system start in the ventral horn, and then they travel out to join the motor neuron. Okay. We're going to consider these to be white ramus fibers before they enter the ganglia. Specifically in the sympathetic nervous system. All right, so before they enter the ganglia, they are white ramus fibers. And as we mentioned earlier, these this means that they are myelinated. After they leave the ganglia, so here's our ganglion, they then become gray ramus fibers, which means that they are unmyelinated. Okay, so that's an important change that happens here in the sympathetic nervous system. Um, let's talk about the levels of the spinal cord, where these fibers arise. So for the sympathetic nervous system, it's T1 to L2. So thoracolumbar section, starting in the thoracic section, T1, all the way down to lumbar section 2, T1 to L2. For the parasympathetic, it's cranial nerves, 3, 7, 9, and 10, all right? So your ocular motor, your facial, your glossopharyngeal, and your vagus. This is where the parasympathetic preganglionic fibers arise. Um, and then we know for the somatic nervous system, it's going to be the entire length of the spinal cord where the motor fibers or motor neurons arise. Okay, let's look more closely at the um, sympathetic ganglia. We know that this structure here is a part of the sympathetic chain. So the ganglia that arise at the thoracolumbar section are the uh, ganglia that collectively form the sympathetic chain or sympathetic trunk, right? Like the pearls on a string. We also know that in the sympathetic system, there are three routes for communication. So where we go from the spinal cord out to the effector tissue out here, there are three routes for that to happen. The first route is a synapse that is a part um, or synapsing onto a ganglia that is a part of the sympathetic chain, which is what we're illustrating here. So synapsing onto a ganglia that is a part of the sympathetic chain. The second option or route was synapsing onto a ganglia that was not a part of the sympathetic chain. We refer to this as a collateral ganglia. And then the third option was onto the adrenal medulla chromaffin cells. Right? Um, and so this route would give us some hormone release, right? So this is where, because it's being released into the blood, it's going to be a, a hormone here, whereas at this typical neuron junction, it's going to be a neurotransmitter. Let's look at the receptors and the neurotransmitters. So at the ganglia, at the sympathetic chain ganglia, in fact, at all of these locations where we have the preganglionic neurons, acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter being released from all preganglionic neurons, and then also the hormone or neurotransmitter being released at the neuromuscular junction. So acetylcholine is here, acetylcholine and acetylcholine. Um, what type of receptor is it going to bind to in each of these areas? A nicotinic receptor. So we have nicotinic receptors here. Nicotinic receptors here. And nicotinic receptors here on muscle. Okay. Um, the postganglionic neurons in the sympathetic system, they're going to secrete norepinephrine. So norepinephrine is released here. 
sometimes epinephrine and to a small extent, sometimes dopamine, right? So we'll put those all here, but mainly norepinephrine. Um, also being released at the sympathetic nervous system and that will bind to an adrenergic receptor here. We talked about the different flavors of adrenergic receptors. So I'll put those in brackets here, alpha one, alpha two, beta one, beta two, beta three. So these are the, all, all the different types of adrenergic receptors that are possible. On the parasympathetic side, the um, neurotransmitter being released here is acetylcholine as well. With that very tiny exception that we listed, which was the um, uh, sweat glands. So the sweat glands on the sympathetic system will also release acetylcholine. Very, very small exception with our sweat glands. Um, the parasympathetic postganglionic neurons release acetylcholine, but they bind to a different type of cholinergic receptor. Here on the effector tissues, they bind to muscarinic receptors. Okay, so adrenergic, muscarinic, and then nicotinic for the somatic or skeletal muscle in the somatic system. Um, we refer to this junction, we'll talk about the differences a little bit um, coming up here as well. We refer to this junction as the neuroaffector junction. All right, the two main differences was that the presence of the varicosities was one, also the greater distance here than we see at this neuron to neuron synapse. So the distance here at the neuroaffected junction is slightly larger than we see at other synapses. Also varicosities are something unique to the neuroaffected junction as well. Down here, we refer to this junction as the neuromuscular junction, because this is going to skeletal muscle. Okay. Um, also, just to quickly review the overall functions of both of these divisions, we know that the sympathetic system is fight, flight, freeze. The parasympathetic system is rest and digest. Also secretions. And then the motor neuron is skeletal muscle, right? So muscular contraction. Both of these we said were involuntary. So we put that up here. Autonomic nervous system is involuntary. Somatic nervous system is voluntary. Okay. Um, let's see if there's anything I forgot. So this is sort of a large overview of just comparing the two branches of the autonomic division and then the somatic division. So let me know what questions we have here. There's a lot of content that can be tested here. Um, I'll pause here and see what questions you may have on this bit. So where these fibers come from in the spinal cord, let's just label that out here. So the lateral horn, Lateral horn, ventral horn. Okay. Um, all right. I don't see any questions popping up. I'm going to continue moving on in just a second. Um, we'll look at the receptors. So we'll look a little bit more in detail at the differences in the mechanisms here. Um, just sort of summarizing, I'm not going to go over each of the mechanisms in detail, but we'll review them and then see what questions we have from that. Okay, yes, yeah, so I'm seeing a question here, alpha versus beta receptors. Um, so let's review them, um, let's see this. Let's review the main differences between each of the receptors and then if needed, I'll go over the individual mechanisms as well. Oops. 
Okay, sorry. Um, so adrenergic receptors. So let's look at each of the receptors. Let's look at where it's located. It's preferred affinity, whether it prefers one neurotransmitter over the other. We will look at its second messenger molecule and what it does to that, whether it increases or decreases it. And then lastly, we'll look at the effects on the affected tissue. Okay, and I apologize for the crooked lines here. Um, so let's start with the alpha receptors. So we've got alpha one, alpha two, beta one, beta two, and beta three. Okay. So our alpha receptors, alpha one is on most of uh, the vasculature of smooth muscle. Okay, it prefers norepinephrine over epinephrine. It is going to increase its second messenger, and then its second messenger is IP3 and DAG. Right, so IP3 and DAG are the second messengers. It is also considered stimulatory to its G protein. So I'm going to put GS here, as in it is going to stimulate its G protein, its coupled G protein. All right, um, its, its effect on the uh, tissue is that it is excitatory. Okay, if we look at alpha two, it's gonna be the same. So mostly on vascular smooth muscle, there are some other locations for alpha receptors, but they're most prevalent on the vasculature, right? The smooth muscle that lines our vasculature. Um, also has a preference for norepinephrine over epinephrine, and then it has a different second messenger. It also has a different action. So it decreases its second messenger. Its second messenger is cyclic AMP. And then it is coupled to a G inhibitory protein. Okay. Its effect on the tissue, however, is still excitatory. And so we talked about this difference what it does to its second messenger and how it brings about that response versus what type of response it is at the tissue level. So these are two different things. Um, alpha-2 is a good example where it decreases its second messenger, coupled to a inhibitory G protein, meaning that it's going to block the production of uh, cyclic AMP, and that results in an excitatory function in terms of the tissue level. And if we think about where um, alpha-2 receptors are on our smooth muscle in the vasculature, blocking cyclic AMP actually results in contraction of those blood vessels, and so that is still considered excitatory. Beta receptors, beta-1 on the heart and kidneys. Beta-2 on the lungs and uterus. And then beta-3 mainly on adipose, right, our fat tissue. Beta-1 and beta-3 have no preference. So equal affinity, norepinephrine and epinephrine. Equal affinity for norepinephrine and epinephrine. Whereas beta-2 prefers epinephrine over norepinephrine. 
Okay, let's look at what they do to their second messenger. So they all increase their second messenger and they all have cyclic AMP as the second messenger. Right. Um, in other words, all G stimulatory proteins. The effect on the tissue is again where they somewhat differ. So beta one and beta three are excitatory on the tissue level. Whereas beta two is inhibitory. And we talked about the main example with beta two being that it is on the lungs and a function of the sympathetic nervous system on the lungs is to inhibit or dilate the tissue as a part of the sympathetic response. Um, so again, not conflating what it does to a second messenger with its effect on the tissue. All right, so here's somewhat of an exception and then here's somewhat of an exception to watch out for as well. 